Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Nancy, and I'm a librarian here at the Chelmsford Library. Tonight, we have Jane O'Neill speaking about one of my favorite subjects, which is libraries. Uh, for those of you tuning into these talks for the first time, our presenter, Jane O'Neill, has been presenting our talks online for us for about two years now. She holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she had the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier's Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Her nonprofit, Culturally Curious, has a mission to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Tonight, she will talk about the surprisingly interesting world of library architecture and design. There's more to, to a library than just shelves and books. Careful thinking and planning has informed the interior and exterior design of libraries as they evolved from medieval stacks to modern community centers. This program will explore the good, the bad, and the amazingly innovative in library architecture with a focus on the last century. I should also note that this is presented in collaboration with the public libraries in Andover, Bill Ricca, and North Reading. Please, everyone, send your questions to the chat, and Jane will answer them at the end. Thank you so much, Jane. I'll turn it over thank to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about this subject, which was just such a delight to uh, put this presentation together. So we're going to have a lot of fun over the next hour. We're going to be looking at really interesting architecture. And um, before I leave this slide, I just wanted to acknowledge that we're looking um, not at a library, but at the parking garage for a library. This is in, in Kansas City, Missouri, and it's called the Community Bookshelf. It dates to 2004, and they did, in fact, allow the community to um, inform which, which texts would be listed here um, in large in, for this particular design. So there's a lot of really fun and interesting things out there. I have a little bit of a preamble to tonight's program sort of talking about my own personal experiences as it relates to libraries and library work. And I wanted to start off as um, in my hometown, because when I was just a teenager, my first job essentially was working at my community public library. This is an old image of it. It didn't look that old when I was working there, but um, you get a sense for the interior and the exterior with these images. I was working as a page, so I was reshelving books and retrieving um, materials from the stacks for people doing research. And so it sort of started off an, an early kind of love affair with this kind of architecture and with the services that public libraries provide. Now, when I was in college and in grad school studying art history, I continued to work in libraries, but I was working in slide libraries. And I have no doubt that um, reshelving sl uh, slides like this and helping to make them, helping to organize them for professors' lectures have definitely informed my work that I do today. Um, and as a fun aside, if you were to do a Google image of slide library, this is such a, an antiquated notion, a slide library, that um, just images of actual slides in libraries are what come up now. This is somebody's personal library in, in South Korea. But back to my illustrious career in libraries. For, um, after college, I ended up working at the Boston Public Library, uh, the, the main branch designed by by Charles McKim. And, um, and I was really uh, drawn to this building. I, before I even applied for a job there, I, I ended up on an art and architecture tour of the building. And I was just blown away by the spaces inside, the barrel vaulted uh, reading room that you see over here on the left, the room after room that was um, 
uh, uh, painted by leading artists, leading muralists of the day. This is a room that was uh, painted by Edwin Austin Abbey. And then um, there's the, the grand staircase. And this was, this was the point of the tour where our, our tour guide talked about this building being designed as a palace for the people. And you've got all this beautiful yellow sienna marble, highly polished. Uh, and I remember our tour guide pointed out that these lions here were, were also marble, but they were unpolished. And so you're halfway up the staircase and you sort of have to come around the back of these lions. And the tour guide pointed out that over the years, so many people had rubbed these lion tails and rear ends for good luck that they have become highly polished too. You can just make it out in the image over here. Um, so if you ever need a little bit of good luck, definitely head to the main branch of the Boston Public Library. But the highlight really of the tour for me was at the end when we walked outside the building and we stepped outside and we took a look back at the building itself. And the, the guide pointed out that uh, written in stone above the door, free to all, it's inscribed there. And he talked, I mean, he waxed poetic really about how, you know, an informed citizenry is the, the foundation of a democracy that that libraries offer this sacred right of access to information, that, that libraries themselves are this temple to democracy. And that's really what you got with, with this Charles McKim building at, at the Boston Public Library. I will admit, I, I shed a tear or two. I was really so moved by all of this. And for anybody wondering, this is the goddess Minerva down, right below here. So the goddess of wisdom tied to this. So shortly after that, um, that transcendental experience that I had at the library, I applied for a job with the Boston Public Library Foundation and landed it and, and worked there for about a year or so before I went back to graduate school. And that organization was really charged with um, helping to preserve the art and architecture of the building itself. So every day I got to spend time in these absolutely gorgeous spaces, like the, the room where, um, where John Singer Sargent painted The Triumph of Religion. So in the years that followed, uh, I earned advanced degrees in art history and art education. And I ended up leaving libraries for art museums, but libraries always held this special place in my heart. To me, they were the temples to democracy that museums always kind of longed to be. They were free, they were open to everyone at a time when museums have ever rising admission prices and they kind of are always battling this reputation for being a little bit cold, a little bit elitist and a little bit out of touch. So the libraries held this place in my heart. And I think that they have so much in touch, at least, or so much in common, I should say, at least architecturally. Um, so even in my hometown of Manchester, New Hampshire, the, the library and the museum, the Courier Museum of Art were actually designed by the same architect. And so that has always had me thinking about this interesting connection between these institutions and, um, and sort of the shared challenges that they, that they face because of this impressive architecture that they so often share. When we think of the world of art museums, I think of, for instance, a place like the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which looks like a classical temple, which has this massive staircase out front, the Rocky Steps. Um, and it's a place that is now really um, understood to be not just uh, uh, physically inaccessible for so many people, but also intellectually inaccessible. It looks like a place that a lot of people don't normally feel welcome. It looks like a courthouse or, or some other sort of civic institution. And so these kinds of challenges that museums face, I think to a certain degree, libraries face them too. In more recent years with my company, I've been going to more and more libraries. And it's such a pleasure to kind of reconnect with these institutions and see them through a new lens. And I've found again and again that they share these same kinds of struggles. I can't tell you how many library staircases I've jogged halfway up only to realize, you know, you're supposed to use another door, or you know, I end up being 10 minutes late because the parking lot is, you know, two doors down or something like that. So the same kind of issues that museums grapple with, I think our uh, libraries oftentimes grapple with. So we have to think to ourselves as we look at these beautiful civic structures, 
are they, are they performing their most basic and most serious function? Incidentally, this is the public library in Lowell, Massachusetts over here on the left. And this is the public library in Quincy, Massachusetts designed by H.H. Richardson. So are they welcoming? Are they, are, are, and are they doing this, this most essential job that they are, are tasked with doing? We'll be considering all of these things after this extensive preamble of mine tonight. So let me give you a, a, the lay of the land, how we'll share this next hour together. We're going to go through a pretty brief history of library architecture, and I've broken it up into essentially three volumes. We're going to look at prehistory or antiquity through neoclassicism. We'll turn our attention to libraries in America, um, consider briefly sort of how that history informed uh, what we see in America, and then turn our attention to um, some really innovative and experimental architecture, particularly in the last century. And then, um, <clears throat> or actually really in the last few decades, and then we'll turn our attention to how libraries are really changing. And I think a lot of these changes are, are kind of moving hand in hand with what we see in, um, in the museum world too, and wrap up with little libraries and then send you on your way. So let's get started uh, looking at this history of library architecture going all the way back to classical antiquity. So what we are looking at here on the left is an artist's imagined rendering of the Library of Alexandria. So um, we, we know that libraries were in existence um, as far back as about 1900 BC. The Library of Alexandria dates to about 285 and, um, and it no longer exists today, of course, which is why we're looking at the, at the artist's rendering. But libraries really proliferated throughout classical antiquity. At one point, the city of Rome itself had two dozen libraries, but the Library of Alexandria was really that first public library that had the mission of universal knowledge, um, which I think uh, is the reason why everybody holds it in such high regard, of course. On the right over here, we are looking at the ruins of of um, one of the, the, the most uh, uh, sort of elaborate, at least architecturally, uh, uh, structures, one of the most elaborate libraries that existed um, it, uh, shortly, a, a, a few short centuries later. This is around the year uh, 100 AD, and it is the library at Celsus in Turkey. So all that's left of it is the facade. The rest of it is missing. But what we see is a really impressive facade with the columns and the niches and um, the four statues here, they're all reproductions at this point, but they symbolize wisdom and knowledge, intelligence and valor. So this notion of entering into this really impressive space to gain access to knowledge is, um, is something that goes back thousands of years. But the idea of universal knowledge is not something that has been consistent over time. As we move up through history, now we are... Um, going to turn our attention to a medieval European precedent here, and, um, and not one that is a public library, but, but in this case, an academic library. This is Merton College at, at Oxford, and it is this building that we're looking at over here on the right corresponds to this building right here. And it is a part of a closed quadrangle. So it's literally closed off from the public. This would have been an, a, a, a library just for students. And, um, and in this case, it doesn't really look like a grand temple per se. The architecture itself doesn't spell out um, sort of a, a transcendental experience when you walk inside. And they had a, a really different approach to, to thinking about uh, access access to information. What, they, uh, what, what the archbishop ordered in the 1200s was that uh, the college's books be kept in these chests that have three giant locks on them. So it's a good reminder that books were precious handmade objects. Um, they were oftentimes the most valuable things that people owned. Uh, but it is, uh, it is interesting to think about early libraries kind of functioning, functioning like a treasure chest. Now, 
um, now we're going to turn our attention, do a little scoop from, from England over to Italy and, and look at a library designed by who else? Michelangelo. So we are in Florence right now and we are looking at the Laurentian Library. Uh, Michelangelo, uh, uh, like I said, he designed it, but it was opened uh, and, and finished about seven years after his death in 1571. Now, the library itself is what we see over here. It might remind a lot of you of, of like a church setting almost with pews, but in this case, these are, are lecterns where you would sit and read. Michelangelo's uh, greatest contribution really to this library is this um, staircase and vestibule that he designed that you would walk up into this space over here. So through this door is the image that we see over here on the right. And he, he takes up almost this entire vestibule with this gigantic staircase that has these unusual stairs that look like they're kind of spilling out into our space. And imagine walking into an area that's really just solely occupied by a staircase. Uh, what's really important here is this idea that, that Michelangelo is emphasizing that you are walking walking into sort of a rarefied realm as you enter into this library. Now, this was the private library of the Medici, and they were really trying to, you know, prove to people that they weren't just merchants, they were also intellectuals. But Michelangelo really set the stage, um, literally, by creating <clears throat> such an impressive staircase and vestibule for this particular space. Now, as we head back to England, we're at another um, university library. In this case, this is uh, Trinity Hall at Cambridge. <clears throat> and we can see how bookshelves and these lecterns, those same lecterns that we saw um, at the Laurentian Library in Florence are now kind of coming together. Uh, and they're still sort of organized as though in a church, almost like pews, but there's space to sit, there's space to read, and there is space to organize these texts. So within um, a, a century's time uh, or so, back at Oxford College, we see the development really of, of the kind of uh, stacks, the, the bookshelves that we're really used to seeing in, in modern day libraries. And you can see that that these stacks from the 1600s at Oxford still have, um, you know, the, sort of the, the remnants of, of the lectern. So there, there's the benches, there's, there's an opportunity to sit and read here. Now, as a reminder that these books were so precious, that the, the access to this kind of knowledge was, was unusual. And it was, um, it, it was, uh, 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 it, well, uh, it, it was a, a, essentially a, a blessing for people of, of means. Uh, and a good reminder of that is the, um, the, the historic libraries, they're, they, they're all over Europe, but this is the uh, Hereford Cathedral's famous chained library that dates from about the 1600s to the 1800s. And it's the largest surviving chained library in the world. So, um, so it, it, it survived over um, um, all of these centuries, but it has been moved around quite a bit. If you were to visit the cathedral today, it's in this kind of modern building over here. So it looks like the stacks that we saw at, um, at Oxford. But of course, the big difference here is that these books are actually chained to the bookshelves. You're not taking them anywhere. Our wonderful modern notion of a public lending library is, um, is sort of out the window at this case. This is uh, that great reminder that, um, that there is, uh, you know, incredible value in these books that they are are rare and um, and the the access to them is is greatly limited, uh, particularly when they are are actually chained to the bookshelves. Here, there's a, a whole chain rod system. Now, before you start feeling bad for the books <laughs> because they're not getting out at all, um, there were some books that were designed specifically to travel. So this is um, a tiny uh, seven. 17th century library, a traveling library that was um, uh, made in for this particular box. And you can see that the, the box itself sort of has um, decoration on it to suggest that it's kind of a, a little um, 
architectural wonder, its own little library itself. And there's about 50 different texts in here and they would have been considered um, the essential, you know, classical um, um, poetry, um, classical history, theology, philosophy, it's all there. You can almost imagine that it's like uh, uh, um, the forerunner to a Kindle or something like that. Now, if you look at these photographs of it, you can see that the text in these books would have, um, would have been really small. You would have had needed very good eyesight in order to enjoy a little library like this. Imagine reading this by candlelight too. What a challenge that would have been. So some books were were certainly made to move, and others were um, were, were chained down. Now, as um, as pub as uh, printing uh, and publication uh, technology advances, libraries grow ever bigger. And so um, by the, the 1700s, we see uh, Trinity College Library of Dub Dublin is just a massive institution with, um, with these really, really high bookshelves. You can see that they're like twice the height of a human. And then another story of it with this long barrel vaulted room. It's so, um, it's so absolutely impressive. And who among us doesn't love the romantic notion of a library with its own little um, uh, 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 ladder to access the, those high up books. So we have, we've got this incredible, expansive, large, overwhelming library at the, at, 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 by the time we reached the 1700s. And here's just another perspective on it. Uh, all of this beautiful wood in, in this particular setting. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And these photographs, I think, are pretty unusual because you can see that there are these cordoned off sections. People are always visiting this place because it is so beautiful. And if you happen to be a Star Wars fan, you might recognize it because I believe it served as the inspiration for um, the Jedi archives. I'm just going to geek out on you just for a moment. So, um, so, so we see that the libraries are now getting ever bigger um, because there are more and more books. At this library in particular, they attempt to um, have a copy of every book published, um, at least they did for, for many years. Now we're going to turn our attention to later part of the 1700s and look at an example of a library from Austria. Austria has so many wonderful examples of really ornate sort of Rococo libraries that look like this where we see the emphasis is not really on the books, but on an entire environment. There's all of this incredible artwork and painting and, you know, undulating walls and paneling here. So visiting this library is a total aesthetic experience. Here's just another view of that same space. Who wouldn't want to spend the entire day there, unless you really don't like this period of art, it might not be your cup of tea, but it is this, uh, once again, a, a really sort of romantic take on, on, um, on a library structure in general, and it certainly does a great job of integrating the arts here. So now we arrive at the neoclassical period, and we are looking at um, the British Museum Library, which dates to about 1855. And neoclassicism, you know, it harkens back to the classical past. So we've got this big rational space, a giant circular room with a dome over it. It's about 140 feet wide. It is um, in every way trying to echo the great structure of, of the Pantheon. Speaking of the classical past, we see it over here in, um, in, in a, a painting by the artist Panini from um, the 1700s. But we have uh, uh, architects who are trying to create this grand space that, um, that references the the classical world. In this case, um, they're not using concrete in order to create this, this perfect domed space. Instead, um, they're using cast iron and concrete and glass. So the structure of it is, is innovative in a different way. And, um, and at the time, this, this was the largest library in existence. And it was really just like a, a beacon, a mecca for, for the, the literary world of, of, of London at the time. So we've come up through the 1700s. Now what we're going to do is turn our attention to libraries in America, something that feels a little bit more at home. And maybe you'll see something that reminds you of your hometown library, the, the, the library that you like to visit now. So um, just a quick reference back to the Boston Public Library. It sort of is the start of, of so many things. It's, it's, and it's a great reminder that, um, that in America in the 19th century, it was recognized that great 
great libraries were a part of any civilized nation's self-identity. They were considered a necessary resource for an informed citizenry. Now, these libraries were being built at the same time as major museum building campaigns. So it's a good reminder for all of us that this building, the, the Boston Public Library main branch, which sits in Copley, uh, Copley Square in Boston was actually uh, right adjacent to uh, the Museum of Fine Arts for, for quite some time before the museum itself moved. So all of these things were really happening in tandem. Now, um, other great cities were erecting huge libraries at the same time. This is New York City Public Library, which dates to 1902, designed by Carrere and Hastings. It was the largest marble structure ever attempted in the US. And of course, it's using this um, classical revival ar architecture in the same way that we saw with, with uh, the Boston Public Library, this kind of projecting porch here um, with the, the grand three portals, uh, a large staircase. And in New York City, they put the lions out front. But it, the lions themselves are another great reminder that harkens back to you know, ancient treasuries and citadels, the protectors for what's valuable inside. And what's valuable are the books, it's the knowledge, it's everything. Um, that you can gain by entering through those doors. Of course, the, the lions are just beloved in New York City. They're always dressing them up for parades and that sort of thing. And I believe they all have, uh, they both have nicknames and, and, um, and they are, they're, they're like the mascots of the city, probably in a different way than the Boston Public Library lions. Inside the New York City Public Library, you have um, these gorgeous spaces throughout, including the Rose Reading Room which we can see is this elegant sort of cavernous space. It just sort of uh, dwarfs the reading room at the Boston Public Library. But remarkably, um, what we see over here on the right is kind of the underbelly of it. What makes the Rose Reading Room work is the seven stories of stacks underneath it. Um, there are so many bookshelves underneath this reading room, underneath the library itself, that if you line them all up end to end, it would be 80 miles of bookshelves, pretty remarkable. And so they wanted to make sure that people would be able to access these books and materials as quickly as possible. So there were these state of the art uh, systems put in place um, so that people could uh, request a text or a periodical and receive it within uh, mere minutes. Uh, so moving on from the New York City Public Library to DC, and of course, we're looking at the Library of Congress now, um, which really did start off as simply a library for the sitting members of Congress. It was uh, built up by uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, personal collection, and then in the later part of the 19th century, Century, this huge building was erected and, and it became a, a, a public entity. And so now it houses the largest library collection in the world. There's 170 million items in its collection and they bring in 10,000 new items a day. Uh, so of course, what we're looking at in terms of this building is not all that um, that is the library itself. But in terms of its architecture, we see it's that same visual vocabulary that we saw um, with, with so many libraries already. It's the neoclassical past, it's the three grand portals, it's the projecting porch. We've got the dome in, um, in the back in the distance with this gold flame um, signifying knowledge back here. And of course, you know, every every bust in in the in, in these niches up here uh, were famous writers. So when you go inside the Library of Congress, the, that underneath that dome in that central space, there's um, this circular reading room with these really sort of big muscular pillars and pilasters here. And you can go on tours and you'd be in these sort of upper registers, but it's the people who are accessing this information uh, who come in, they'd really just start in this space, request information at the central desk, and then sit and study and read here. I believe there's a great scene from All the President's Men with Woodward and Bernstein, you know, studying away, burning the midnight oil at the Library of Congress. 
But in terms of influence around the US, um, nobody really compares to Andrew Carnegie, who we see in a portrait from 1905. In 1901, he was the richest man in the world. And his passion, um, the way he wanted to spread his money around, his philanthropic mission was to create libraries. And so he ultimately funded, uh, uh, I think, about 2,500 libraries worldwide, and about 1,700 of them were in the United States alone. What we're looking at over here on the right is um, the main branch of the Pittsburgh Public Library. He, of course, hailed from Pittsburgh. We see a lot of familiar ar um, architectural elements uh, over here, including, if you have good eyes, it says free um, free to all people just above the door here. So he um, he had a, 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 great, a, a great sort of philanthropic mind here, charitable uh, spirit, as it pertained to libraries, at least. And even in Pittsburgh, his hometown, if there was a community that didn't yet have a branch library to it, he um, funded this home library program. The program involved delivering these wooden boxes full of books to homes and neighborhoods without any library branches. And believe it or not, every week, a volunteer would go to these homes and read to the children, talk about books with them, tell them stories. Uh, I think it's a really innovative model, <laughs> uh, and it, it's probably about 100 years old at this point. So because of Carnegie, you have... Um these libraries, these Carnegie libraries, about 1,700 of them, all built between roughly 1883 and 1929, representing at the time that they were built about half of all the libraries in the country. Now, over here on the left, we are looking at the Taunton Public Library from 1902, designed by Albert Randolph Ross. It's in this kind of Beaux Arts style, could be easily be mistaken for a bank. Um, over here on the right, this is the Rockland Public Library in Rockland, Massachusetts from 1903, designed by McLean and Wright, and this is in a Georgian revival style. Now, um, Carnegie was, um, he believed in investing in people that were already industrious and ambitious. So you kind of had to lobby for him, lobby to him in order to receive funds for a library. And after the first few libraries that he funded, he, he began to feel like they were a little bit too extravagant. I mean, you don't get to be the richest man in the world by giving away too much. So he wanted to rein in what these communities were asking for. And eventually he and his, um, his, his secretary, his administrator, come up with uh, basic plans that different libraries can use as they apply for these funds from him. So these, uh, these plans uh, are probably seem pretty familiar to, to most of you. And, and it's been argued recently that these plans um, are, are really great plans for 21st century libraries that don't necessarily require um, extensive, extensive bookshelves or stacks. Um, they require meeting spaces big open tables. This is what Andrew Carnegie's libraries were all about. Incidentally, I should mention too that almost all of them have a staircase leading up and a lamp right by the door to signify enlightenment. And it's that reminder of the, the Michelangelo design staircase. Like you're, you're, you're heading into a different kind of space. And that little staircase prepares you for it. And of course, it is an accessibility nightmare today, these days too. So it's really hard to to find to to distinguish Carnegie libraries from non Carnegie libraries, unless you're looking at the cornerstone, you you might not be able to tell. For instance, my hometown library is not a Carnegie library, but it is nearly identical to the Carnegie Library in Springfield, Mass, designed by the same architect. So you can see how Carnegie's influence really spread um, throughout the country, and um, and I, I mean we we owe him a debt of gratitude for that certainly. Now, one last um, interesting uh, postscript as it relates to these Carnegie libraries. Uh, like I said, he, he wanted to give funds to, uh, to people who were willing to help themselves. And so in the South, um, there were several Black communities that, that lobbied to him for, um, for funds for libraries. Now, 
Andrew Carnegie never told libraries in the South to integrate. He never made that a part of, um, of his gift to, to fund a library, but he did fund segregated libraries, segre uh, white libraries, and in the case over here, a black library. These were both uh, libraries that he funded in Savannah, Georgia. And incidentally, um, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas grew up here and wrote about it, this in his memoirs, his memories of attending this segregated library or of visiting the segregated library as, as a child. So it's interesting to think about that continued influence on into the 21st century. Um, they have, of course, been desegregated since. Um, all right, so now let's turn our attention to how libraries really began to change in the 20th century beyond uh, integration. Um, architecturally, how they began to change. Uh, beyond the influence of Andrew Carnegie, what do new or newer libraries look like? We are looking at the Brooklyn Public Library here, which um, had initially been started and had planned to sort of look like a Carnegie Library, but funding got held up and it wasn't finished until 1940. And the plan really evolved during that stalled out time. So what we're looking at is an art deco library, a really unusual, great example of an art deco library. Notice the Egyptian um, columns here, these kind of obelisks that, that, that welcome you in. But the great element of this design is that it sort of opens up like a book um, as you're looking at it here. And it's as though we're looking at the spine that you're heading right into the stacks as you walk into this library. A lot of innovative architecture in terms of library design in the 20th century comes from um, the world of academics, uh, academia. So here we're at Yale University. This is the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library designed in 1963 by Gordon Bunshaft. And, um, and this is just one, one of my favorite libraries in the world. It's a building that can just really knock your socks off. And it was designed to protect uh, um, the, the, the rare texts and documents that are held inside. So the architect in this case designed a building without windows. This is a marble block of a building, essentially. You enter here um, through through um, glass doors. There's, there's glass at, at the bottom level here. And then you rise up into this marble building and the marble is cut so thin that you can see if the light is just right. It shines through it. it actually, as I look at it now, it's reminding me of that highly polished uh, marble at the Boston Public Library. But the stacks, all those rare texts are inside this glass enclosed space uh, right at the center of, of the building here. And um, I remember hearing, I, I don't know if it's just legend or folklore, but there's even um, a really advanced uh, system to protect these books from fire too. Essentially the air gets sucked out of that glass case uh, if there were to ever be a fire in this building. But, um, but the really innovative use, well, the innovative use of marble here to diffuse the light, to create this rarefied realm for in this space is just something that knocks my socks off every time I see it. Another really innovative library for an, uh, for an academic setting is right here in New England at the Phillips Exeter uh, Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire. So this library was designed by Louis Kahn in 1971. And what we get on the outside is this kind of unassuming exterior. It's, um, it's made of brick. It's in that way kind of matches the rest of the campus. Um, and the committee that was tasked with, with finding a designer said they wanted um, a library that would be unpretentious, though, in a handsome, inviting, contemporary style. And, well, we'll see for yourself if you think that, that Louis Kahn delivered on that, because this has certainly uh, been recognized uh, year after year for its innovation. Now, they asked that he design something, a, a library that's not... Uh, not focused really on housing books, but on housing readers of books. So as the, the Yale library that we just saw was all about keeping light out at, um, at Exeter, we can see that Louis Kahn prioritizes light for, for the students, for, for reading, for academics. So there's over 200 of these carols here that are right up against the, the windows and the students themselves can even control the light that, that, um, that they're dealing with, almost like little air plane windows here and and then the books themselves are kind of set back from the light again to protect them uh, but you'll also see here in the image on the right 
that there's a mezzanine here. So there's a main floor and a mezzanine. And he does that on every level of the building. So, um, so what was supposed to be a four floor building, no more than a four floor building, um, ends up being about nine floors when all is said and done because you have basement, ground floor, one, one M, two M, <laughs> and so on. So, um, so it becomes this really impressive space when you walk into the atrium. Uh, I believe Louis Kahn referred to these as concrete donuts, these big circles that have been cut out. So here you are standing in the center, you see these incredible materials, the wood, the concrete, the, the simplified forms, these perfect circles, and, um, and sort of like Michelangelo, you realize that you are in this rarefied realm here. Um, so like I said, this library in particular has been recognized year after year for, uh, for its innovative design, and I think it, uh, very useful and functional design as well. Now, since uh, the, the turn of the century, we have seen a dramatic shift in library building class uh, practices. We see a lot more glass, a lot more concrete, and a lot more big name architects. So we are looking at Salt Lake City's main library here, designed by um, Moshe Safdi from 2003. And what he did with this library design was he created a top destination really for Salt Lake City tourists, not just people that go and use the library, but for people, everybody who's in Salt Lake has to see it essentially. And there's, it's a building to be experienced in so many ways. So it has this massive um, bridge that leads you up to the top of the building and you get this incredible view of the surrounding mountains. Here is that staircase. That, um, that you can walk up to reach the, the roof. So, um, so all of a sudden, what has been traditionally kind of a, um, a, a contained, a, a, a siloed, um, small community resource has become a draw for people from around the world to come inside and experience. And, um, and part of that is with a big name architect, part of that is with a really um, interesting design, but um, it's also this notion that he's leveraging the beauty of this space as well and how people can access it. Here's just a quick view inside. Um, it's interesting to me because the interior space here you, uh, reminds me so much of a mall. And I, as, as I understand it, there is, there's, um, there is some shopping down on the first level here, but beautiful staircases and, um, and really interesting to see how he kind of balances out um, that, that retail space on the main floor with, with, the, um, with the library space up above. All right, so the next uh, uh, sort of new and um, innovative design that we're going to be seeing is the Seattle Public Library. Now, Seattle had a lot of money to throw at this particular building. Um, this was designed in 2004. Per, uh, forgive my pronunciation, the, the architect here is Rem Koolhaas. Now, the library is 11 stories. It's glass, it's steel, and it's right there in downtown Seattle. Now, what always kind of blows me away about this design is that um, depending on what angle you're looking at, it, it looks like a completely different building. Now, this building, uh, sort of like the Salt Lake City uh, 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 Library, sort of promised to bring people in. And they did see this incredible bump in terms of new economic activity that was happening around this library, $16 million in new economic activity just in its first year. And a lot of these people were patrons who were coming to use the library itself. So there was a lot of celebration in terms of this design and and, and how it was working, you can sort of get a sense in terms of how it's divided up inside. I find this to be a really confusing schematic, but I will tell you that within the space of a few years, uh, the critics sort of revisited this building and decided that it was not successful in, in any way. Um, uh, I'll just read you a few of the quotes here from Lawrence Cheek. He's the architecture critic of the Seattle Post Intelligencer. He, in 2007, he said that the library was confusing, impersonal, uncomfortable, and oppressive, and decidedly unpleasant, relentlessly monotonous, 
badly designed and cheesily detailed, profoundly dreary and depressing, cheaply finished or dysfunctional, um, concluding that any praise that he had written about uh, earlier had been a mistake. That is pretty scathing. These are two interior views of that library. And you can see it, there's, to me, a perplexing sort of uh, large mixed use space here. So we have stacks right adjacent to meeting spaces. That's not so unusual, but it looks like there's dining right here. And then just on the other side, an open auditorium. So you can just imagine how, um, how sound is kind of bouncing around in this space and how it sort of lends itself to probably a lot of interruptions here. So I can sort of see where some of the criticism <laughs> might come from, but one, um, one library that was designed in Canada that's been uh, that's very innovative and has been largely celebrated is the Central Library at Calgary, Calgary in Alberta. This was designed in 2018 by the firm uh, Snow, Snowheda. Now, the, the design that we see here, this kind of arch, is supposed to be a reference to this cloud formation, this Chinook cloud formation that um, that people frequently see in Canada. And you can see that the, the side of the building itself sort of uh, dissolves into glass. Well, the, 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 the solid structure dissolves into glass in these, um, in these uh, 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 in these sort of interesting shapes, some of them kind of look like open books and some of them look like houses, interlocking houses. And interestingly, this library is designed, um, is, is cited actually in the, uh, along this corridor that literally is unifying two different sections of the city. And, and um, people even describe it as like healing this wound between these two sections of the city. And you can also see it's really accessible by public transportation as well. Inside, there's this beautiful use of, of wood. There's these huge open spaces. Um, a lot of the staircases you can see sort of double as, um, as like a informal auditorium spaces too. And it was designed in such a way that it would move from fun to serious. So you'd, you'd have um, spaces on the main floor where people could gather and, um, and learn and be entertained. And and on the top floor is like rare book section and, and spaces for research. So this has been a one design that I think has largely been celebrated. Not all modern design certainly gets a good reputation. This is another example from Canada. This is in Edmonton, Al, uh, um, Alberta. And, um, and they had a really interesting approach to redesigning the, their library. They essentially took the exterior walls off of it, um, left the structure of the library intact, but they wanted an exterior that kind of matched the arts section of the city. And so they felt like they were being promised one thing um, by their architect and they were delivered something else entirely. I love this tweet here that says your dating profile pick versus the dude who's sitting across the table from you. So promised one thing and maybe delivered something else. People compare it to a battleship, to dumpsters. It is decidedly not popular. And it's, um, it's a reminder that modern isn't always better and it's not always going to bring the crowds. Uh, here's just a quick view inside. And like I said, the inside wasn't, um, wasn't modified that much. So uh, we're going to kind of round out this section on innovation with a few experiments that maybe have gone awry. Uh, I want to show you uh, an academic library in, um, in Germany. This is, this library is, um, it's called the Brandenburg Technical University Library in Cottbus, Germany, designed by Herzog and Demuron from 2004. I love the exterior of this building. It's sort of in the shape of an amoeba. It's got um, this glass uh, exterior, this undulating glass form. And then there's this kind of scrim that goes over it. And it looks like glyphs. It looks like text. You can probably see it a little bit better over here on the right. But they're all overlaying each other and it's sort of indecipherable, but it gives you this, this sense that you're walking into uh, this structure, which is, uh, I think, seven stories high, this structure that is going to give information. The inside, the interior design is not necessarily a place where you would want to dwell. We've got lime green, we've got hot pink. Uh, these colors were apparently chosen for wayfinding purposes, but um, but I, 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 I've even read from people who have attended the 
the university that they did not find it appealing at all. It wasn't a place where you felt like you could sort of sit down and focus at all on your studies. So maybe they didn't quite hit the mark here. You might say that's true for this next library too. It, this is a rendering for a proposed library in, um, in Prague in the very picturesque city of Prague where I don't think they've had a major building built since the 18th century. And they decided, you know, let's go big for a public library. They had an international competition and this was the unanimous decision on the design. And it's been held up ever since. It has not been built. Um, and you can probably understand why there's a lot of, um, of concern about this, this particular design here. Um, but one recent library that was just, um, just open and hailed for being really like an architectural mar marvel is the Hunter's Point Library in Queens. This was designed by Stephen Holt Architects and, um, in 2019, but it was really a 15 or 20 year process to get this library built. And, um, and it came with a huge price tag, about $41 million. Now keep that price in mind. This library has been hailed by the New York Times critic as um, uh, the finest and most uplifting, one of the finest and most uplifting uh, public buildings in New York City so far this century. Here's another view of it here, a little bit more praise. It's been called a stunning architectural model. It's got a great view, that's for sure. Now, looking back across the water at it, it's been called a beacon of learning, literacy, and culture. But there are a few problems inside, um, specifically as it pertains to accessibility. And that's sort of where we started off today, right? Thinking about big staircases and, um, and people being able to literally physically access the, the, um, the resources inside the library. So what we're looking at here is um, an expanse of, of um, of bookshelves, I think there's just three of them, but they're part of the adult fiction section and they are not accessible uh, by elevator. You can only access them by staircases. There's other sections of the library as well. This is just part of the children's room that, um, it, that you can only access by stairs. Now, as somebody that almost always goes to my own public library with at least one stroller, <laughs> I can tell you that this would be a nightmare. And you would think that for 41 $1 million, you wouldn't run into any accessibility issues. So th since then, there's been a class action lawsuit. There's been um, all sorts of, um, of, of an uproar, essentially, in, in, from uh, disability rights groups uh, uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, the inequities that are represented here. So um, sometimes modern can, uh, can uh, fall short in terms of its pro promises. So let's turn our attention now um, in the last few minutes to some of the more playful designs and the novelty architecture, the duck ar architecture as it's called, that we've seen in more recent years. Um, and these are sort of um, sort of a, a parallel attempts to keep a, a muse a, a library architecture interesting, to keep it relevant to patrons, uh, not really attempting to create architectural wonders or architectural masterpieces uh, that might draw visitors from around the globe, but these are attempts to engage. And I think that these architectural attempts to engage really parallel what's happening in, um, in the library world and in the museum world because it's really only in the past few decades that libraries and museums have be, have come under one umbrella, um, the, the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And I think there's been cross-pollination there. So some of the best practices that you see in museums comes um, into comes, you know, sort of seeping into libraries and vice versa. You see more and more texts in libraries these days. These days, you see more interactivity, um, or, or you see more texts, I should say, in museums and more interactivity in, in libraries. What we're looking at here is an image of a concierge librarian, um, somebody who's an expert in accessing these resources who could sit down with you and really help you plan um, how, you know, what you're going to uh, uh, find and, and how you would access it, whether it's audio, 
audio or um, or on the written page, but it's it's a personable experience here, and um, and it would be an experience that that is created to make you feel like a valued uh, uh, patron at at this particular library. We also see librarians; they've always been creative, but I I think in in more recent dec decades we see them being um, creating more interactive displays, um, the, more displays that, that feel like they are reaching out and trying to engage people in new ways. And that is paralleled certainly in the architecture. We talked a little bit about um, the Kansas City Public Library parking garage here, the community bookshelf. Um, this It's just such a fantastic uh, facade here. And I think it just draws people in. They're curious about the architecture and they're very curious about what's behind it. I think it's always a little bit of a letdown to know that it's just the parking garage, but there are spaces um, inside that, that sort of correspond to what you see outside and they draw you in. Even when there are these um, sort of just fanciful flourishes, they make you experience the environment of the, of the library in a whole new way. And you can see, um, innovations like this, not just at Kansas City. This is the Duluth Library that was designed in 1980. So you've got a few book spines at, at, um, on the ground level here. Also at the Philadelphia um, Airport, incidentally, the Philadelphia Public Library has their own um, sort of welcome center, their own hotspot, uh, similarly with the giant book spines and kind of a fun uh, space for people to, to gather and, um, and utilize the, the resources. They actually uh, sign people up for, for library cards at the airport there. So this motif of, of having the oversized architectural uh, book spines uh, is, is something that you, we see repeated again and again. This is another example uh, from Turkey from 2017. We can also see it in, um, in other kinds of design, in the art and architecture associated with libraries. This is called Sitting on History from 1995, designed by the sculptor Bill Woodrow. And this is at the British Library in London. A really interesting book design where <laughs> we can see uh, what seems like a giant antique, antique book um, attached to this ball and chain. Now, um, Generally speaking, art historians refer to this ball and chain as um, as being, you know, the as a book kind of functioning as a captor of information from which we cannot escape. But to me, it reminds me of this history of, of books that that you could not borrow, books that you had to sort of dwell with. Um, and so, uh, so there's a, a great nod to history for for me, at least when I look there. Uh, there are other ways to certainly to engage patrons as well. The um, the Michael. Graves Design Public Library in, in Denver, Colorado, has all of these wonderful components to it. But in the main atrium area where you sort of get oriented, they have a space to just uh, return your books. And if you're like me, when you go and return your library books, it's usually outside and it's big box and it's an experience and it's just done. But if you're also like me, you're probably wondering, who's the person that actually empties this at the end of the day? What does that whole process look like? Well, um, at Denver, they, they made the process as transparent as possible. They, they put the, the whole process behind glass and you have this wonderful kind of mechanical experience of, of submitting one book at a time, spine first up this conveyor belt and you see the people and the whole process unfold right in front of you. And this kind of transparency you see in art museums as well these days. Now, another, I, I think, real sort of cross-pollination that we see happening in libraries is is, um, from museums is how children's rooms have really evolved over time. Um, here is an example from uh, Singapore up here in the upper left. The, uh, this is an example with the dinosaur and, and the lighthouse from California. Uh, down here, the castle is from Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, in this uh, STEM space, oops, sorry. Um, the STEM space over here is from Cheyenne, uh, Wyoming. So uh, children's rooms in libraries really look a lot more like children's museums. They are, pla they are places that you engage, they are places to play, um, and just the environment itself, to a certain degree, facilitates literacy. So it's really interesting to think about how these spaces and how the functioning of, of the libraries around them have, have evolved so much. Now, at 
this library, this public library in Chapel Hill, uh, they, ha they have these sculptures outside of um, a turtle, a snake, a rabbit, and a frog, because these are the creatures that appear in so many uh, children's books. And so they're these uh, slightly oversized sculptures, and they have, you know, story time around them. And to me, they make uh, probably much more wonderful mascots, much more relevant mascots to children than maybe the, the, um, the protective lions that we saw a century earlier. Now, um, here is just a, an interesting sculpture really related to libraries. And this one is situated not too far away from the State Library in Victoria, in Melbourne, Australia. It's called Architectural Fragment, and it dates to 1992. The artist is Petrus Sprunk. And so what we see here, of course, is the structure of a library, the building itself, or at least the kind of architecture that we have long associated with libraries, sinking into the ground as though there's quicksand or lava or water here. And it's just, we just see sort of the last gasp of this building. Um, and maybe it's the last gasp of this type of building. Maybe it's the last gasp of this type or antiquated notion of a library. It's kind of a respectable edifice. Um, of a bygone era. <laughs> Just a few last um, instances of kind of playful design that get people thinking about libraries and books in, in wonderful ways. Another um, uh, book benches, these are proliferating all over the world, but uh, these particular book benches are in um, Borges, uh, Bulgaria, not too far from the public library. This is a book tower at the Prague Municipal Library. And it's really just a stack of books that's arranged in such a way that is very Instagram friendly. <laughs> and then of course you have Painted Steps. This is a favorite for so many people. This is the Northfield Public Library in Northfield, um, Minnesota here, rep uh, replicating the spines of, of beloved books. If you can't hire an architect to do uh, you know, the building itself, you could transform the steps of your building. This is from 2021. And of course, people love books and they love their own private library so much uh, that people do this in their own homes with their favorite texts these days, which is a great transition to um, our last topic today, little libraries. So let's turn our attention to the fact that people now put their own books in little tiny buildings <laughs> out on their front lawns. Free Little Libraries um, is, uh, or Little Free Library is a nonprofit organization based out of Wisconsin. And their mission is to be a catalyst for community building, inspiring readers, and being accessible, really. So once you decide to join this network, you are listed on their website, you're listed on their maps, and you can um, take a book, you can leave a book, um, but you decide to host and, um, and to help to foster these connections in your own community. I think it's a really interesting kind of expansion on that early notion from Andrew Carnegie about uh, these boxes of books that would travel to um, different communities, um, uh, books that would have otherwise been accessible to people and, um, and they would move around <laughs> from week to week. So, um, so it's interesting to think about how this notion of sharing and, and trading and borrowing has evolved over the last century or so. Now, during the pandemic, these free little libraries have become like, um, well, sometimes like little community pantries as well. Of course, we can see the toilet paper and the food in, in this particular one over here. But what we're really interested in for our purposes tonight is the idea that these little libraries are their own little architectural wonders. And what's so great about this nonprofit that hosts this is that they encourage absolute creativity with the design of your little library. So some of them are sort of um, uh, you know, seem to reference, uh, uh, you know, actual library architecture, and some of them are just really wild and fun. <laughs> so um, what's really interesting to me is that um, if this is something you want to do, and you don't really know how to get started, sort of like Andrew Carnegie, <laughs> Little Free Little Libraries has plans that you could use. So if you feel like a lot of the libraries you've seen look a lot alike, it's because there's, uh, there's a guide for getting getting started, which might be of interest to people with us tonight. So, um, so let's wrap up. Let's, let's 
let's think about what we can take away from everything that we've seen today. All right, so um, what we have looked at tonight, what we've considered is really the fundamental role of a library and how it's always been about sharing knowledge and making connections. Now, historically, architecturally significant buildings have been designed to reflect that sacred role in, um, in civic life. So these libraries echo in many ways the architecture of, of important buildings in our communities, of courthouses, and yes, of, of art museums too. And today we have looked at buildings that exalt so many different facets of, um, of what libraries have come to be. We, we've seen uh, libraries that were designed specifically for security purposes from the chain library to the rare book library at Yale. We've seen libraries that were really about the, creating a, a, a complete aesthetic experience for patrons, that they were made to, um, to be the homes for, for great art. We've also looked at libraries that were really concerned with innovative design, whether that was the use of, of new materials or um, really interesting, innovative ideas, as we saw with the, um, with the, with the German technical library on the right. We also looked at some libraries that prioritized interaction, um, the, the patrons experience while they're there, whether it's, um, it's a hands-on experience in the children's room or a hands-on experience for patrons as they're returning their books. And then finally, we looked at libraries or thought a little bit about libraries that are all about creating a sense of community, even if it's for people on the fly or just walking by. So we took in a lot tonight. <laughs> and, um, and I think that a big takeaway is that there is no one right way to design a library. And the fact that we keep finding really interesting and innovative solutions tell us that this is a form that will be reinvented for years to come. So we have a lot to look forward to there. So I will end for now and I'll do my best to try and answer any questions that you might have. I'll start looking at the Q&A here. Um, Judith asked right off the bat early on, the first library I worked in was the Manchester, New Hampshire Public Library, the Carpenter Memorial Library. Um, John says, uh, Trinity College just approached a major rehabilitation project, millions of dollars. Do I know anything about it? Ooh, I do not know about that offhand. Um, it, I'll have to go back and explore um, what facets of the building that, that they need to address. And Laura added that the Book of Kells is there. Yes, and that's probably why they have that cordoned off space just for the tourists. I, I understand that they try to have um, the Book of Kells visible for, for tourists as much as possible. Um, how many libraries did Andrew Carnegie fund? So about 2,500 in total and about 1,700 of those were in America. And I think he was, I, I've read anywhere from like $10,000 to start a library to around $70,000, but we can see that uh, generally speaking, they were designed the same way, just essentially with a different exterior to them or a limited range of exteriors to them. So the, the layout was, was typically pretty similar for most of them. Um, and there are some good websites out there too. Um, if you're interested in finding out if a library that you know of is a Carnegie library, uh, start with Wiki, but there are other websites too that, that list all of the, the, the Carnegie libraries as we know them, because there isn't always great documentation about that. Um, Judith asked, which one was the black library? The um, segregated library that I showed you was in Savannah, Georgia. So there were two images there. One was the library for white patrons. And then on the right was the, um, the library for the black community there. Uh, Mira says, I think these innovative buildings are more appropriate for museums than libraries. I agree with the assessment of the Seattle library. Yeah, that was scathing. <laughs> People need quiet to read and think and research. That's an interesting take. And, uh, you know, in some ways, I sort of I sort of lean in the same direction, but at the same time, I, I don't think that we necessarily have to tie ourselves to just one form for what a library could or should look like. But I, I don't know if it necessarily has to be like an international um, architectural draw. Um, Amira says, this one looks like an airport terminal that could have been any number of the ones that I showed you. Um, 
Edmonton library looks like some things from Star Wars. Laura says that was the one um, where they just took down the walls and put up something really modern. And they, uh, uh, people were referring to it as a dumpster. I could see something from Star Wars certainly there. Uh, looks like there weren't a lot of people who are fans of that particular design. And Mira says, none of these are cozy. Kids would be afraid to go into any of these ugly structures. Uh, I could see where you're coming from on that too. Um, too much emphasis on the architecture and not on the purpose. It does seem like there was a mismatch in that for, for a lot of these. Um, so I'm glad you contributed that. Anne says, I wonder if you've seen examples of library architecture that attempt to reflect the cultural diversity of the community where they're located. I'm prompted to ask this because I was surprised given Denver's demographics to see that the signs in the large atrium were all in English. Not to dwell on this, but so many families whose first language is not English might not feel so welcome there. I hope other similar communities have done better. And what a great thing to point out. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting to think of just for me being for more probably more familiar with um, museum building campaigns and just knowing what it's like to try and gauge, uh, you know, renowned architect. Um, uh, when you're think when so much of this is driven by um, a, a desire to have that kind of prestige, I think there is probably uh, a sense that that uh, people are being left out, whether it's people who speak other language or languages or people with different abilities, as we saw with the um, with the with the library in Long Island. So um, so I'm glad you made that comment and it, and it sort of extended upon um, that note that I was trying to hit in terms of accessibility. That was a great point. Um, Jan, thank you for your very kind words. I, this was a lot of fun to, to work on, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, and it is fun to think about the, the little libraries as being architectural extensions of what we know today. The library with the beautiful painted ceiling was in Austria. Let me see if I have in my notes which city in Austria, but there's a lot in, in Spain, in Austria, um, in that part of, of, um, in, of Europe, there's so many great, really gorgeous <laughs> examples of, of libraries uh, designed in a similar vein. Let me just check back to my notes here and see if I have that handy. Okay, that was um, Admont Library. I don't know if I have the name of the town. Oh wait, it's, I think it's in Austria, or in Salzburg, I'm sorry. I think it's near in or near Salzburg. We might have to double check that one. Um, all right. Rosemond says the school I went to had carols in the library, but you, um, but you never hear that word anymore. Is it out of fashion? I was wondering that too, Rosamond. You really never hear that word anymore. Um, but maybe it's more of a, a maybe it's more of an academic uh, term or, or a term that you use more for academic libraries. But if there's somebody here who knows better, they might be able to answer. Um, a great question here. How are libraries dealing with the changing mix of books to digital and mixed media and what architectural changes is that inspiring? There's all sorts of, uh, well, I mean, there's, uh, the, this is like a whole other presentation basically, but, but, um, but I sort of hit on just what I understand very briefly is that um, these Carnegie libraries that only had like a limited amount of space for actual physical resources, you know, stacks for books, that sort of thing, and prioritized these big spaces, big tables, meeting areas, uh, that these actually work pretty well in the 21st century because so much is digital. So it's interesting to think that as libraries are changing and the resources that they house are um, getting smaller in many ways that, um, that you might not need as much space for, for, for the books themselves. I, I know that there's been conversations of the New York Public Library about moving the stacks uh, essentially off site. I think that was uh, uh, decided, they decided against doing that. But, um, but this is, a, I think, an ever evolving question within um, the library world. And it will certainly impact the design of libraries for, for um, decades, if not centuries to come. So that, that's sort of the key question tonight. So thank you so much. Um, Pam, my good friend Pam is here tonight and she says, 
I didn't know you worked in libraries, learn something new every day. Why did you choose museum work over library work? Uh, good question, Pam. I think I just really loved art history and studying art history. And initially I thought I would be, a, I would go for a PhD in art history, but uh, when I started giving tours in museums in grad school, I just realized that I really liked people too much to be doing uh, such, you know, limited focused work. So that's how I kind of ended up here. <laughs> um, the best little library, free little, little free library I've seen had an old wall style rotary phone attached to the side and a sign that said, please dial zero for the reference librarian, Teresa. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Wendy's asking about community, are communities reassessing their needs, less print media with the advent of eBooks, audiobooks, movie apps, thinking about downsizing their libraries to, um, to alleviate taxes. That's a really interesting question. And I'm sure that there's probably some people on tonight who are on the boards of libraries and probably having these conversations. I don't know of a specific one other than, you know, the conversations that were happening at the New York Public Library about what, what was to happen with, you know, the seven floors of stacks essentially, but I'm sure, it, I, I'm sure most communities are probably having this kind of conversation these days. Laura says space is important, but the books is where it's at. My first library was in a, a few old classrooms of a school. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm there with you, Laura, too. I, I, that's why I go to the libraries for the books themselves. Do you know if bookmobiles are still in use in the US? Teresa, what a great question. And I can't believe I didn't hit on that in, in, this, in this program. Um, maybe that's a part two, but I, I, I know that in my hometown, they are still used. So I imagine that throughout this, the US, they're, they're still probably pretty active, um, getting, getting books out to people who wouldn't otherwise get to the library. Lisa, thanks for your kind words. Let's see. Oh, just some really nice comments here. I appreciate. Um, thank you so much. And I hopefully you're just looking at libraries in different ways. And now, now when you go into any other um, community, you're going to want to wander into their library and assess really, you know, how it's working and how accessible and welcoming it is. Let's see. I think somebody raised their hand. Um, Maria, um, I'm going to allow you to talk, or you can um, type your question if you'd like. Hi, Maria. Hi, I just want to thank you so much. It was really fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm really glad you enjoyed it. I, I really appreciate your comment. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I think Judith also has her hand up. So I'm going to ask you to unmute as well, Judith. I just want to say that you are fabulous at what you do. I have enjoyed every single one of your presentations, and you are a thorough researcher and presenter. Judith, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, my head's going to be this big. Um, well, I I think um, I have a friend here tonight, Lisa, who really helped me out with a lot of the research on this one tonight, and I really appreciate her work on this. Um, and I have a wonderful volunteer who always helps to put together uh, images as well. So it's it's not necessarily just a one woman show here. And no, but it's, um, it's how you present. It oh, just thank flows. you. Thank it you very flows. much. <laughs> and, and very well, thank you, everybody. entertaining and captivating. Thank you Thank so you. much. This is what I love to do. And I feel very honored that um, that you take time out of your day to, to spend it with me. So thank you. I think we've hit um, most of the questions and I've tried to do my best to answer them. But as always, if you have any um, other comments, corrections, <laughs> suggestions, feel free to get in touch with me at my website. I am culturally curious. I think we got one more raised hand here. Joyce, I'm going to allow you to talk, ask you to unmute. Hi, Joyce. Hi, can you hear me? I just, yes. uh, you, you made me interested in looking up the library in the city that I used to live in and it was a Carnegie. 
library oh, that yeah. was yeah, and it, it and I it has the front steps. I looked at a picture just to remind myself with a little lamp on the top, and he gave fifty seven thousand five hundred dollars for them to build a library oh. after the original library were burnt down. So it was very interesting. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you got to learn a little bit more about your hometown library. That's so great. <laughs> Thanks for sharing I put that. It in the Q I had put it in the Q&A, but I don't know if you ever saw it. Oh, I might have missed that. I'm sorry. That's okay. But thank you for sharing it. <laughs> All right. I think we've gone through everything. I really appreciate everybody's very kind comments. Um, next month, <laughs> we will be doing Keith Herring. And, um, and his fantastic uh, works of art and sort of talking about his life as a young gay artist as well. So that should be really interesting. So I hope you can join me then. And thank you again, everybody for joining us tonight. Have a great rest of the week. Take care.